Hello and welcome to another of our 2020 Wiener Pioneers presentations. Each year, Bloomberg NEF names 10 game-changing companies from the field of energy, transportation, and sustainability from around the world. Our pioneers are usually companies that have been operating for no more than 10 years, and they generally have annual sales of under 50 million US dollars. Each of our pioneer must offer a service or technology that is new, different, and disruptive. We then have our expert panel that evaluates the pioneers on three main criteria, the level of innovation, the potential to scale, and the momentum to grow the business. In today's segment, it's my big pleasure to welcome Daniel Barrel, CEO and co-founder of RE. RE is an Israel-based company that produces completely flat and modular EV platforms that can then further be customized. And Daniel is going to explain to us in a second how that looks like. And afterwards, I'll be asking him a few questions in our Q&A sessions. But for now, Daniel, welcome and over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica. And, uh, you know, on behalf of uh, Re, I'm really honored to accept this award. Um, all of us in Tel Aviv, Germany and the U.S. are immensely proud uh, to be recognized as a 2020 pioneer by, by BNEF uh, and their, you know, the independent experts that chose us. It's funny because when we started back in 2013, Achishai, my co-founder and I, uh, nobody ever believed that an Israeli company would be considered a pioneer in automotive from, you know, from a small country in, in the Middle East. And uh, seven years later, um, we're talking here today and uh, We've, we've, I think we've come a long way. Uh, Re's technology is, is different because it's not bound by traditional thinking and automotive concepts. We've completely rethought, re-engineered, reinvented literally the electric uh, car, the, the platform that it carries uh, in order to provide the future of mobility a much broader view on how they can build new services, new applications, things that might, we might have thought of or might have not yet thought of, but can be the basis of, our, of the future of our economy. And um, it's, the past seven years has been amazing and I think we've only just begun. So it's really interesting and fun to, to be part of this amazing industry that is changing right before our eyes um, with a brand new approach of, of EV. Thank you so much, Daniel. So I'm going to continue with a few um, questions and maybe can you explain a little bit more the, the thought process about why create this completely flat EV platform? Why do we need it and how is it different to the way EVs are manufactured to date? When we started back in 2013, everybody was talking about, you know, the future of, of uh, mobility. The car is going to be electric, uh, shared, connected, autonomous. Um, and it was mind blowing, but everybody was still building cars conceptually upon century old concepts. If you think about it, braking is about 120 years old concept. Uh, steering is almost 150 years old concept. It doesn't make any sense to build a vehicle on concept that old. Why would we carry a vehicle? that is so ancient. If you think about it, for example, how much space is wasted under the hood of our cars, under the trunk of our cars. We carry that with us everywhere we go, but just wasted, wasted space and wasted weight. So we thought to ourselves, why don't we allow the other pioneers in this industry, the service providers, the ones who are building this, this new mobility services, a clean sheet of paper, an ability to build anything they want without any limitation, without any concern as to how to carry it, how the vehicle would perform, to be able to just design everything they wanted. Now, the way to do that is conceptually by trying to build a completely flat platform. Flat platform actually exists. It's called a train. But uh, if you remember, I mean, trains are roughly quite quite high because you stack up all the components and and 
doesn't really make a lot of sense to build something that's stacking up. So what we try to do is try to create a brand new technology where we are packing the entire drive components of a vehicle, the drivetrain, the powertrain, the steering, the braking, the suspension, everything into the corner of the car, literally fitting it where within the wheel arc. By doing that, we completely freeing the chassis from all drive components. It's basically a big battery pack. And because it's completely flat, completely modular, you can build anything you want on top of that. And that gives service providers the ability to build whatever they want, any, any dream that they have. Daniel, from design to production, getting an automobile on the road takes at least a couple of years. And if we look at the, the major auto, auto manufacturers that strategies heavily rely on building their own proprietary platforms for you know, economies of scale, etc. So how do you see yourself breaking into that circle of the design phase and enter this market as a, as a startup? We see a seismic shift in, in automotive industry, you know, with the structure of the OEM changing right before our eyes. Uh, the, the traditional structure of an OEM tier one, tier two, et cetera, is, is shifting into a different structure where we have three different layers, one on top of the other, where the basic layer is the platform providers, us, company like us, that build the platform. On top of that, you've got the service provider. It can be, for example, an Uber or an Amazon or any other service that you would want to have. And on top of that, the data provider, where V2V, V2X, cyber, cloud computing. Those three layers work as one, as a stack, in order to provide a vehicle and a service to support it. And we see a lot, a lot of new mobility companies coming into this market with the ability to disrupt it. And we came out of stealth just actually a year ago, exactly a year ago now, uh, right after we've been able to secure probably the world's biggest uh, supply chain, sorry biggest supply chain of more than 320 production lines across the world, together with the world leading few ones that are helping us to carry this, this load of moving from concept to production at an automotive grade, automotive scale in a global level. Is there maybe a success story in terms of where you've collaborated with a major OEM and um, an example you could share? I think the best example, the most recent one, uh, is a collaboration we announced together with Hino, which is the truck arm of Toyota, uh, last year in the Tokyo Motor Show, uh, where we designed the, uh, uh, the fl together with them, we designed the platformer, which is the basis of the entire mobility of the uh, as a service for them. Um, I'm sure that in the next few weeks, we'll hear of a few others, a uh, few other collaboration that we've been working on quite hard in the past few years. Um, we've only just begun uh, telling the world what we can do. We've been very, very busy uh, behind the scene, under the radar, in actually delivering what we've been dreaming to. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean a lot if you just dream and you cannot execute. And it's so important for us to make sure that we can. And this is why it took us so long to be in stealth mode, almost six years. Uh, but today, with the world's probably biggest uh, supply chain and partnerships and agreements that we have, we, we are taking more and more orders on a daily basis uh, and growing our, our order group uh, exponentially. We've, we've never honestly thought of so much demand in so short time. So talking about execution, the, all the orders you're getting in, so can we already see your re-platforms in use today or are you still building them and we can see them in the near future? Since we want to put, keep some suspension for later, what I can say <laughs> is um, you're going to see them on the road much faster than you probably think. Um, they've already been tested with quite a lot of our partners throughout the world. Um, and we're going to launch the first one quite soon. Great. Well, then we'll keep the suspense. That's totally fine. Um, maybe if you can share a little bit more about the use cases. I know your, your focus is, you know, quite heavily on logistics, 
commercial um, transportation, last mile deliveries, shuttles. Can we also expect to see your um, platforms used for personal passenger vehicles in the future or in what other contexts will we be able to, to see them? First and foremost, um, our technology applies for, for all, all kinds of vehicles, naturally, but we choose to focus on commercial vehicles and shuttles and, and delivery vehicles because we first believe that the um, commercial vehicle market is growing exponentially. We are buying more and more um, online. Somebody needs to deliver those packages. Um, the efficiency needs to grow. The fact that we're autonomous ready today, uh, we're probably the only level five uh, capable company in the world today on, on, on the uh, um, platform basis, that is. It is a big advantage for fleet managers to um, utilize our uh, platforms for the future electric fleets. Because when you look at uh, commercial vehicles and delivery vehicles, we have a very strong impact on reducing the cost per package, which is super important um, when you think about how you can scale deliveries and, and logistics. And by reducing the uh, cost per package and dramatically reducing the total cost of ownership, we can provide fleet managers the ability to actually build much more efficient, scalable, and effective fleets. And this is where we want to put our focus on. Probably later on, although we already started, we're going to move into the uh, shuttle business of moving people. Um, the thing with shuttles is that Unfortunately, uh, autonomy on the driver's side is not yet fully matured. So that's going to take a little bit more time, um, but we're anxiously waiting for that to happen. I do not see us moving in the near future into uh, passenger vehicles, per se, because we honestly believe in a world where um, vehicles will be shared, hopefully autonomous, connected, and electric, but will be shared. And therefore, we would like to create vehicles in the sharing, therefore not personal. Daniel, thinking about the design capabilities, since you, know, you provide the platform, I can fully design my own vehicle. Would you even, you know, are there maybe new types of companies that, are, will be, that you'll be working with? Maybe it, it won't be the traditional OEM, but Will it be design companies or you know others that don't have be, since they don't have to worry about you know the technicalities of the, the drivetrain and the platform? Yeah, that's that's exactly what it is that we do. Naturally, we work with with OEMs and very big commercial vehicle uh, companies or logistic companies. But one thing we've seen in the past year uh, that we've been out of stealth is that there is so many other companies, we call them new mobility companies, that are more interested in, in the service to provide, in the uh, um, autonomy, robotics, uh, um, service that they can provide without the burden of building the vehicle. Nonetheless, the current design of vehicles just doesn't cut it. It's not, it's not exactly what they were looking for, and therefore they have to compromise on, on the service or on the design. And we find it very very interesting, a lot of fun to work with these new mobility companies on building their future vehicles, which sometimes look completely different than everything we've seen today. Daniel, can you share a little bit about you know, the, the obstacles that you've faced over the last year in terms of your business and product development? What, what, what kind of the, the biggest challenges to date? Our biggest challenge is um, honestly scaling fast enough. Um, we've seen such a great pull from the market that we've actually three times now in the past year accelerated our plans. Uh, every time we, we, we put a very aggressive growth plan and we figure out it's, it's not even close to be enough and we have to grow faster. So we've been growing now outside of Israel naturally to, to Germany, uh, to the US and soon to Japan uh, in order to be able to meet the demand in terms of, of who we are and, and, and the talent that, that we attract. 
Uh, so this is a major, major challenge. And honestly, um, with COVID, uh, trying to scale a company is, it's not impossible, something even close to that. It's doable, but it, it's different. It's different uh, because some, we grew so much and some of our employees I've, I've never met. And that's a new feeling for me because I usually meet everybody. Um, so this is one. Uh, second is that um, with, the, with so much pull from the market, it's sometimes challenging to filter. Um, we can't do it all, naturally. We have to prioritize. But how can you prioritize? How can you, for example, tell a company which is a new mobility player that, that show you an amazing business plan and, and technology that's going to revolutionize the world, but, but they cannot commit to numbers such as an OEM. But probably, hopefully, they will be as big, if not bigger, than OEMs today if, if they execute their plans tomorrow. And, and therefore, the balance of, of traditional, uh, I would call it uh, traditional uh, automotive and new mobility is, is challenging. How, how do you balance both? So with so much, you know, demand coming in, but you're facing up obstacles to scale as well at the same time, getting in talent, where do you see or would like to see RE in five years time? What we've learned that every time that I try to envision it, it happens quicker than, than you know, the time frame we put for that. But we'll try again. I hope that if you walk and the streets of New York within five years time, you will see quite a lot of vehicles running on new platforms. And you'll see services you've never seen before working in a way that nobody thought possible then, but it will be the standard of tomorrow. Daniel, what's, your, um, what's the one thing that investors should know about RE and they should take away from your company? If there's one thing for investors to know is that we always under promise and over deliver, always. I'm sure they'll be taking note. And then my, my last question for you today, what does it mean for Re to be named a 2020 VNF pioneer? Honestly, that's, we're still trying to digest. On a, it's such an honor. We've never thought to be recognized as pioneers for, for being a player in automotive. We, we, it's such an honor and we're really excited. Um, one, that we've been named as such, but more that you know, somebody out there actually recognizes the, uh, the future uh, potential of what is it that we do today. So thank you for that. You're welcome, Daniel. And on that note as well, congratulations again from my end for Re to you and your team. And I'll be looking forward in five years' time to see um, see your platforms on the road uh, on the roads of New York and across the world. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much.